Well, good morning, friends. My name is Blake Holmes. I'm so excited that you are here. We are deep into March. You know what March means? It's the most wonderful time of year. March means March. Madness. Madness. How many of you filled out a bracket? How many of you have a lot of red on that bracket right now? Yeah, that's exactly right. I think uh, my friend Bruce Kendrick, yep, I called him by name. I think he might have scored maybe 40 points. That's it. So uh, Bruce is the ultimate loser on our staff team. <laughs> did I say his name out loud? I think I just did. Uh, listen, I love March Madness because I love the rivalries, the pageantry, the bands, the last minute shots, the Cinderella stories, the friendly banter amongst friends, a chance to connect with old friends, all the rivalries that, that are, exist out there. March Madness is a ton of fun. It's a ton of fun. I wanna show you a picture of one of my friends who um, found himself amongst other friends, let's say. Uh, he is a Kentucky Wildcat and he was amongst Georgia fans in this, this particular year. And you can see they welcomed him with open arms. <laughs> the, the reason why I show this to you, which he gave to me, which I think is a great picture. I mean, that is a great picture. I mean, look at that. Uh, the reason why I show this to you is, is because there are times when it's Christians we are gonna feel like we stand out in a crowd. And it's not gonna be a friendly rivalry where it's all about basketball. It's gonna be where it, it comes at a cost. And there's, there's loss and there's pain and there's hurt. Why? Because we wear a different uniform, so to speak. It's because our convictions and our belief and our faith compels us to live in a way that's different than the world. And you're gonna be mocked, you're gonna be laughed at, you're gonna be overlooked, ostracized, and it hurts. And I'm, I don't wanna be Debbie Downer this morning, but Watermark, let me be clear. I think it's gonna get worse. And I think it's gonna get worse in our lifetime. Today, you could say you know and love Jesus and you could come to church and it might cost you, but I think it's gonna cost you more in our lifetime, I really do. And I just wanna know that my heart, that your heart, that we're ready for that. Much more than just being booed and laughed at because of a basketball game. But are we ready when the world turns against us and says, hey, I'm not so excited about you meeting on Sundays? Some of us experience it right now. I think about students who, at a young age, they begin to walk with the Lord and, and teachers and professors, they begin to ostracize them and belittle them. If you don't experience it in high school, you will in college. Think about students who's, who sit there on Friday night, the phone doesn't ring. Their friends drop them. I think about friends in here who I know who are overlooked for promotions. Why? Because the conviction of faith and the way they live it out. Doesn't make sense within the folks that they work with who are just driven by the bottom line. I think about, um, you know, the way in which sons and daughters feel ostracized by their parents because they happen to make a profession of faith. And it's really divided your family. I mean, Christmas comes around and it's awkward. Why? Because you, you believe that Christmas is about something much more than Santa and, and gifts that are exchanged. Walking with Jesus sometimes feels very lonely. And if that's you this morning, then this message is for you. That's First Peter is, is writing to a group of people who are experiencing persecution. And because of that persecution, they've literally been forced out of their home and now they're scattered in different places. They're suffering from their, uh, because of their faith and Peter writes to encourage them and tell them that there's hope. 
that there's hope and there's victory because of what Christ has done for them. And they can walk with hope because they have a glorious future. And they need to hold on to the victory found in Christ because their suffering and the opposition they experience creates opportunities for them to be an, a witness in a hostile world. We're looking at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. And um, truth be told, this is a thorny passage. And uh, I was talking to friends before the service down here, like, all right, what, how did you get chosen to teach this passage? You'll know what I mean when I read it. Here we go. Chapter three, verses 18 through 22. We're gonna walk through this just verse by verse. Here we go. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. All right, so this passage can be broken up in three parts. In, in verse 18, you see Christ suffering. And then in 19 through 21, we're going to look at Christ's proclamation. What did he proclaim? To whom did he proclaim? And then verse 22, Christ's exaltation. And I want you to stay with me. I want you to remember the context. Peter's writing to a people who are experiencing opposition and they're suffering because of their faith. It's coming at a real cost. Now, previously he talked about how Christ is our example because Christ suffered unjustly. We should follow in his example and we can suffer. We can endure and suffer unjustice because Christ did it for us. He left us an example for us to walk in. This is a little bit different of a passage. This is a passage which is speaking of not follow his example. This is a passage of encouragement that, hey, you are on the winning team. That there is victory in following Christ that the out, outcome of the game has already been determined. So be encouraged, walk in strength and faithfulness and boldness. That's what this passage teaches, okay? So let's look at verse 18. This is so significant. I want to walk slowly, phrase by phrase through this passage because you must understand this. It's the gospel in one verse. So we're gonna take it phrase by phrase. Here it is. Let's start at the very beginning. For Christ also suffered once for sins. This is so important that you understand that Christ's death on the cross was sufficient, final, complete. What he did is he paid the penalty for our sins. It is paid in full, it is done, it is finished. That's why he could say, it is finished. In the Old Testament, sacrifices were made in anticipation of the ultimate sacrifice, but none of the, the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. They were just a shadow of the substance that was to come, Jesus Christ, who was eternal and perfect. And because he was eternal, righteous, perfect, the very son of God, it is over. There's no more need for sacrifices because it's finished. Hebrews 10, 12 through 13 says, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. It's finished. Waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. We, the Bible says we've been justified by faith. We've been declared righteous. Now listen, I want you to hear me really clearly. Have you ever walked into a Roman Catholic church? Do you notice what's different in the Roman Catholic Church? Is that Jesus remains on the cross. Why is that? Jesus remains on the cross because in the Roman Catholic theology, what happens is, is we draw upon a bank account of grace. 
But then what happens is you sin. So through the sacraments, you continue to draw upon this bank account of grace. And he is, so to speak, re-sacrificed. That's not what we believe. We're not Roman Catholic in our theology. We are reformed in our theology. We believe in the tradition of the reformers that Christ died once for all. You have been declared righteous. His righteousness is credited to your account and you are secure because you've been saved by the perfect blood of Jesus Christ. Notice what it says, the righteous for the unrighteous. This is so important. The righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus served as our substitute. He was fully God, so as to be without sin. And he was fully man, so as to serve as our substitute. He could take our place. The righteous for the unrighteous. 2 Corinthians 5 says, he made him who knew no sin to become sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him, okay? The righteous for the unrighteous. He was our substitute. He paid our penalty on that cross that he might do what? Bring us to God. This implies that we were once enemies of God, separated from God because of our sin. But what was the purpose in which Christ died on the cross? to reconcile us to God, to bring us back into a right relationship with a righteous, perfect, holy God. Romans 5, 1 says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace. Not like an internal peace, like no anxiety. No, peace with God because we're now children of God. You following me? Everybody with me? being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In other words, since Christ died, he died a physical bodily death, but was resurrected, Christian, no matter what you're going through, you have hope because Christ was resurrected and he lives, so shall you. That death is not the end of the story. That that is a crazy profound thought. That As believers, when we gather and we mourn and we do mourn when we lose loved ones, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve because those we love we're no longer gonna spend time with, but those who know Jesus we're one day gonna be reunited with and we come and we declare what is true. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. One commentator said this, resurrection means the worst thing is not the last thing. Amen to that. Resurrection means the worst thing is not the last thing. Death is not the final word. You still with me? First Peter 3, 18, we see Christ suffering. But really what we see is Christ's victory over sin and death. And because he's victorious, regardless of the opposition that we experience, the suffering we face, the loneliness we may feel, there's hope because we have a glorious future and he secured it for us. Now, those of you who are visual learners out there, I want to see if I can illustrate this in a familiar way. Hang with me. <laughs> but here's a simple way to understand everything I just told you. We have been separated from a perfect, righteous, holy God because of our sin. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 says. That's you, that's me. All of us. And we're over here. That's you. I'm pretty short. That's me. (laughs) Now it is true. It is true. Some people live a more moral lifestyle than others. And so they, they say, hey, look, I'm a pretty good guy, you know? And so 
What they do is they think, well, I go to church, I pay my taxes, right? I give generously and I'm not as bad as the other guy. And it is true. You may be more athletic, more moral, more righteous. So when you try to jump to earn God's love and his salvation, you jump all the way out there. But you know what? I run and I'm not in good shape and I jump right to right here. But here's the problem, gang. I'm not in competition with you. You want to know what the standard is? Holiness. That's the standard. And we all fall short of that. But here's the amazing thing. 1 Peter 3.18 teaches us that Jesus Christ came and on the cross, he built the bridge between a sinful man and a perfect, righteous, holy God. And so as the God man, the one who was fully God, the one who's fully man, he is the only means of salvation. That's why he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. That's why the book of Acts says, there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. He's the only bridge between a sinful people and a perfect, righteous, holy God. And so we don't come to him saying, look at how far I can jump. You should be so impressed. We come to him recognizing our sin, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But it's not enough just to believe in that. It's not enough just to intellectually understand it. We must trust in what Christ has done for us. And when we rest and we trust in that, then we are forgiven, we're made new. Spirit of God lives within our lives. We have hope and we can face whatever opposition is out there. In the Protestant Reformation, they said it like this. We have been, we are the, the five solas, the, the clarion call of the Reformation. We've been saved by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, according to the scriptures alone. We've been saved by grace alone. There's nothing good in and of ourselves that merits God's favor. By faith alone, it's not by our good works plus what Jesus did for us. No, it's only what Jesus did. By faith alone, in Christ alone, because he is the God man. To the glory of God alone, not because of anything we've done or figured out. According to the predetermined plan of God, the scriptures alone. And because of that, friends, if you don't know anything else, or you tune out for everything else I say the rest of the day, don't miss what I just shared with you. Because that is the gospel, the good news, is that Jesus Christ came to offer us life. And because of that, we have hope. And because he not only died on that cross, but three days later rose again, it validated everything he claimed, said, and did. And because he's alive, we can have life. Amen? Amen. It's not just what it does for us though after we die. It's the resurrection that gives us life, hope and power and meaning right now that marriages could be restored. The lives could be changed and that you can live with hope and peace. Now, let's get to verses 19 through 20. Here we go in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Okay, um, this, this passage is what I refer to as an interpretive challenge on many levels. Okay, it raises so many questions when you're reading scripture. It's just, it's good to ask questions. What does that mean? So first of all, who are the spirits in prison? Were there unbelievers in the, who died in the days of Noah? Fallen angels who were cast into hell, the dead prior to Christ? What did Christ preach to them? Did he preach a message of repentance, his victory over death, their final condemnation? Where did Christ go? What does it mean? Where did he go between his death and his resurrection? Did he go simply to the place of the dead? Did he go to hell? And what did he preach? When did he preach rather? In the days of Noah, between his death and resurrection, after his resurrection? I mean, there's so many questions here. 
The good news is Martin Luther, the great reformer, he said this about this passage. A wonderful text is this. In a more obscure passage, perhaps, than any other in the New Testament. So I don't know. <laughs> this is Martin Luther. <laughs> Let me just tell you as a pastor, when Martin Luther goes, I have no idea, that makes you a little nervous before Sunday. <laughs> so I don't know for certain just what Peter means. So let me, let me just have an aside real quick. And I want, I want to tell you, whenever you come to a difficult passage of Scripture, that's why I like preaching through books like we're doing, because we're just going verse by verse. And we're just having to, you have to, you have to go through the, you can't skip that passage. And so I just want to, as an aside, as you're reading God's Word, let me, let me encourage you with a few thoughts, okay? Anytime you're reading God's word and you come to difficult passages, one, don't skip them. Wrestle. Years ago, my wife and I were training for a bike ride around Lake Tahoe. And Lake Tahoe is a lot of hills. And in our training program, there was times that would call for hill days when we'd ride our bikes. And I'll just be honest with you, there's just days where I just want to go, oh, hill day. Let's skip the hills. And you're tempted to skip the hills because the hills are hard. But you know what happens? You don't become a very good cyclist if you skip the hills. In the same way, if you read scripture and you're kind of like, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God and being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Oh, I like that. So you highlight that. And then you just go, in which he went, okay, no, I don't understand that. Uh, verse seven, end of all things is a hand. Nope, that's not good. Uh, don't be surprised when fiery trial comes upon you, verse 12. Still not good. Um, oh, here you go, verse five. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Okay, then I highlight that. That's not the way to read scripture. You, you, gotta, you gotta take the hills, okay? Number two, remember context is key in any passage of scripture. You gotta read that verse in context of every paragraph, every paragraph, each chapter, each chapter, each book, each book, context of the rest of, of scripture. And context is more than just literary context. There's a linguistic, cultural, theological. There's a lot, a lot to every passage. You don't just pull out a verse out of context. Context is key. And thirdly, you want to interpret Scripture with Scripture. The best interpreter of Scripture is Scripture. You want to take the unclear passages, and you want the clear passages of Scripture to help you interpret the unclear. Okay. Scripture will not contradict itself. So if you see it and you go, oh, there's a contradiction, it means you've, gone, you've taken a wrong turn. It could be unclear, but you want the unclear passages to be interpreted by the clear. And, and then last, and I just have to say this, the meaning resides in the text, not you. The goal of Bible study is to understand what was God trying to communicate through Peter to his, the original audience such that we could understand that and then interpret it and apply it to our day, okay? And then fourth, we want to learn from others throughout church history. That we, we, like no other time in the history of the world, we have the opportunity to get on the internet, read books. There's so many great resources, teachers, commentaries, websites where you could go and learn from so many great resources and learn to see, hey, how's this verse been um, understood throughout literally the centuries? How has the church understood this passage? And you can do that. And so now I wanna warn you, not all resources are the same. Just because it says it somewhere on Google, that doesn't mean it's so. Okay, there are good doctors out there, friends, and then there are not so great doctors out there. You may still call them doctor, but it's not necessarily the one you want to go to when you're sick. There may be people who will tell you, hey, I've got the interpretation, but it may not be the one you want to believe. And if you ever come across someone or you yourself find yourself in the place where you go, I'm the only one who understands it like this, that's a bad place to be. Okay, so you don't want to be novel in your interpretation. All right, having said all that, what I want to do is, is I want to walk you through this passage, verses 19 and 20 specifically, 
And I'm gonna share with you three common interpretations and we're gonna climb the hills for no more than three or four minutes. Some of you, we're gonna drop. That's what they call it when you're on the hills. Hey, don't be dropped, okay? If you don't wanna climb the hills, you can look at your phone, read the Watermark News. I'll tell you when we're getting out of the hills, you can come back, <laughs> okay? If you've climbed the hills before, you're gonna be familiar with what I'm saying. You're gonna go, oh, you know what? That was helpful, I've, I've wrestled with that. If you've never climbed the hills, what I walk through, there's no way I can put, help you understand all this in a short message, but I'm gonna give you enough to where you're gonna go, okay, I can come back to it. You ready? Everybody, who's gonna climb the hill with me? Come on. All right, here we go, here we go, you ready? Here we go. This is what we're trying to figure out. What in the world does it mean? Who are the spirits in prison? Where did Christ go? And what does this mean? Okay, the first one is this. It is commonly held that Christ descended into hell between his crucifixion and his resurrection to proclaim his victory over death. Now this has been popularized by the Roman Catholic theology and some versions of the Apostles' Creed, which perhaps you grew up stating, which, which sta stated he descended into hell. But there's debate over the original wording of the Latin of the Apostles' Creed. And it's the difference between the word inferos and inferna, which means to the dead versus to the underworld. And so depending upon what tradition you grew up in and depending upon um, the uh, Apostles' Creed that was used, um, you may have grown up believing that Christ died and then he went to hell. But the point that was being made, I would argue, is not that Christ went to hell. No, Christ went to the place of the dead because the, the argument is an argument of Christology, who was Jesus. And at that time, you wanna understand that Jesus was fully God and fully man. He died a physical bodily death and that was the point that was trying to make because he serves our substitute. So he died and he went to the place of the dead. He died a physical death. He was fully man, he served in our place. The Westminster Confession corrects the Catholic theology even and says Christ's humiliation after his death consisted in his being buried and continuing in the state of the dead and under the power of death till the third day, which hath been otherwise expressed in these words, he's ascended into hell, okay? So I think, um, where did Christ go? I do not find that Christ went to hell. He, went, he was dead, he died a physical death, and he was buried. He went to the place of the dead. Now, who did he preach to? What did he preach? There's two interpretations of this I wanna unpack with you. And I know this is, um, we're in the weeds. Remember, we're climbing the hill, climb the hill. One thought is the pre-incarnate Christ preached through Noah to unrighteous humans before the flood. Notice what it says here. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Okay, so some have argued, hey, what this means is, is Christ was just simply, pre-incarnate Christ was simply preaching through Noah to those of the day who disobeyed, which brought upon the flood. And the support for this is, is that Peter is, describes Noah as a preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2, 5. And 1 Peter 1, 11, Peter refers to the spirit of Christ in the Old Testament prophets. Yet this doesn't, this answer doesn't explain where Christ went. It seems to, if it's the pre-incarnate Christ preaching through Noah, why do we have language about where Christ went? It seems to not satisfy our questions. And then the third option is not that Christ preached through, the pre-incarnate Christ preached through Noah to unrighteous humans, but Christ proclaimed victory over fallen angels after his resurrection. Now that sounds really strange. Spirits in prison, fallen angels, where do we get that? Well, you have to understand, and again, now we're at the very top of the hill, hang with me. If you're familiar with the book of Genesis, you always have read Genesis chapter six, you see Genesis six, one interpretation of the sons of God who cohabitate with humans. Many people believe, and in Jewish literature, when Peter, when he wrote, it was believed that those were fallen angels. 
okay? And the word for spirits almost always in the New Testament refers to angelic beings. The idea of imprisoned spirits fits within Satan's imprisonment in Revelation 20, verse 7. And I've told you that you want to compare Scripture with Scripture. When you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the final judgment. People look at that passage and they go, oh, look. So it's, it's the fallen angels. They were fallen angels at this time in prison when Peter wrote, okay? And it says in Jude, Verse six, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the day of the, of the great day, until the judgment of the great day. That's Jude verse six. Yet this view doesn't explain why Christ would proclaim his victory over specifically these fallen angels. There's no view that you go, oh, that's it, it's obvious. Okay, we just finished our hill crawling. Are you ready? Everybody follow me on that? Kind of. I get it. Here, here's the point. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take every verse and go, what does that mean? How are we to interpret that? And we've come to a passage where we go, wow, there's, there's lots of options here. So what do we do with it? Well, well here's what I would say. Wayne Grudem, one, one commentator, he said it like this, and I so appreciate this. He goes, hey, this passage once cleared of misunderstanding, should also function today as an encouragement to us to be bold in our witness as Noah was. To be confident that though we may be few, God will certainly save us as he did Noah. And to remind us that just as certainly as the flood eventually came, so final judgment will certainly come to our world as well and Christ will ultimately triumph over all the evil in the universe. What's he saying here is that, look, th we may wrestle over, hey, who are the spirits in prison and what exactly is the nature of this? But the application, the big picture view is simply this. If you do not know Jesus Christ, it is your time. Today is the day of salvation. Get on the ark of salvation. Because just as there was a day in which Noah was calling people to repent and get on the ark because judgment is coming and people had to look at him and go, what a fool for trusting and believing there's gonna be such a flood. Why is he investing in wood and wasting his time? If you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm begging you to consider everything I've shared with you this morning. I'm begging you to consider what 1 Peter 3, 18 says, the most clear passage in this whole paragraph and your need for Jesus because there will be another flood. There will be another great day of judgment. It is coming. 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10, you see Peter, he warns us, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise to some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish but all should reach out to him in repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and be dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Friends, just as God flooded the earth in Noah's day, someday he's going to come back. His son, Jesus Christ, is going to come back. And just because he hasn't come back yet doesn't mean he's not coming. The only reason why he hasn't come is to provide us another day and offer us repentance. Every day is an invitation to his grace. And so he waits because he wants more to come to know him. And if you're a believer, this passage is so clear in saying, hey, like Noah, hold on. You remain steadfast, you preach. Even if, it, even if you're ostracized, overlooked, feel funny, at times, even if you're sitting in a crowd of Georgia fans, are all throwing things at you. It's worth it because one day you're gonna be vindicated. Note that it says that just eight persons were brought safely through the water. Hey, 
If you're going to walk faithfully with Jesus Christ, let me just, just count on it. There's going to be days you're going to feel like you are all alone. Just count on it. I mean, if you, if you want to walk with Jesus, you, you're going to feel like you're swimming upstream. Why do I say that? Well, in Matthew 7, 14, Jesus said, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So let's look at verse 21. Notice it says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is also difficult to understand, but he's speaking metaphorically. Notice what he says. He says, now baptism, which corresponds to this, this illustration now saves you, not a removal of dirt from the body. What he's saying is baptism is a picture of salvation of what God does for us. When we trust in Jesus Christ, we are baptized. We identify with him. We are put into the water. We identify with his death and burial and we come up to new life. We've been saved through the waters, if you will, just as Noah was. And it is our countercultural proclamation Count me in with Jesus. That's what baptism is. I want to be a part of the family of God. It is a welcome to the family. I am a believer. I am identifying with Jesus Christ publicly, boldly. Here I am. Count me in. You can know the uniform I'm going to wear. And so you are baptized and brought up to new life. Just as Noah was saved through the waters. And so this illustrates that we no longer will will face judgment, but we too will live. Not the mechanical action of baptism, of just going through the motions. For my Church of Christ friends who grew up believing that baptism is necessary for salvation because of Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. That's what Peter said. But 1 Peter 3 explains, is a good cross-reference and explains what is meant in chapter 2, verse 38 of Acts. Yes, you should repent and yes, you should be baptized. But notice, baptism is an outward expression of an inward faith for those who have been saved because they placed their faith in Jesus Christ, not because they went through the mechanical acts of being baptized. Okay, verse 22, the passage I'm most excited to share with you this morning. You still with me? All right. This is so important. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Now, This passage is so important because I really believe most Christians don't understand the significance of what is referred to as the ascension. It is critical. It is critical. Obviously, Paul makes the point in 1 Corinthians 15 that you take away the resurrection, there is no Christianity. But you have to understand, we stop at the resurrection and we don't consider the ascension. What is the ascension? That Jesus not only rose from the dead, but he ascended to the Father. He left earth locally from a real geographical place, visibly in front of many witnesses, bodily, in physical bodily form, not some uh, um, ethereal state. And today, some of you are gonna go, what, is that right? Today, the God-man is at the right hand of the Father. The God-man. Kevin DeYoung, he An author today, a respected author, he says this, and I want you to understand this, the God who in the fullness of time became man will never, for all time, cease to be a man. The ascended Christ shows us what Adam was supposed to be and what he will one day become. Not the natural son of the father, but kingly and priestly sons of our father given to rule on the earth. The ascension, friends, is significant because it teaches us that Christ triumphed over his enemies, that he reigns victoriously, that he's at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. The right hand is a position of authority and privilege. And he's not here on earth anymore. He ascended. He is with the Father. He's at his right hand. He reigns triumphantly over over all all of creation over all spiritual forces. The Heidelberg Confession coming out of the Reformation says this first, he pleads our cause in heaven in the presence of his father. 
Think about that. Revelation 12.10 says that Satan is known as the accuser of the brethren. Well, guess what? You have an advocate. So he pleads our cause in heaven in the presence of us. Second, we have our own flesh in heaven, a guarantee that Christ, our head, will take us, his members, to himself in heaven. One day, you and I, we will be raised bodily, resurrection, in heaven with him. Third, he sends his spirit to us on earth as a further guarantee. By the spirit's power, we make the goal of our lives, not earthly things, but the things above where Christ is sitting at God's right hand. The ascension is so crucial, friends, because so many of us, we walk embattled, what? By the voice of shame. Even as believers, we beat down, hearing voices like, I don't measure up, I don't belong, I'm not good enough, I'll never be accepted, I don't have what it takes, and it's against all this, the ascension says, Jesus says, you are forgiven. You are freed. You are loved. You are mine. And it doesn't matter what the accuser of the brethren says anymore because you're mine and I love you and you're secure. I grew up uh, playing sports and, uh, and I remember one friend of mine, no matter what game we were playing, every competition we went to, he was probably the best athlete on the field, but his dad's voice was so loud. And every time he missed the goal, or threw an interception, or missed the kick, or whatever it was, whatever sport we played, you could always hear his dad. You could just hear his dad just condescending above all the crowd. And I just thought, man, what, what would it be like to live with a, don't come home tonight, literally. What would it be like to live like that? Knowing that your dad is just in this constant disappointment. If that's your view of God, friends, that you don't understand the gospel. You don't have a father who's sitting there going, oh, you missed it again. You missed it again. No, you have, you have, you have a God in heaven who's a good father. And shame is never his tool. That's the tool of the enemy. The ascension reminds us that God in heaven he pleads on our behalf. Jesus pleads on our behalf that the accuser of the brother has not won. He will not win. And there's life and there's hope and we have peace with God now because of what has been accomplished for us. Amen? Amen. So you, friend, no matter the opposition you're gonna face in this world, walk knowing that your savior, Jesus Christ, reigns triumphantly and someday you will too. Someday you will too. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for a passage which just reminds us that, that you're good and that we don't have a God in heaven who's disappointed in us. He's not mad at us, but he loves us. And I thank you that Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for our sin. That he died in our place and he bridged the gap between his sinful people and a holy, righteous God so that we could have life. We'd have peace with you. And if we just trust in this gift of your grace, we're a new creation and dwelt by your spirit with hope of knowing that one day, Lord, we will be with you. And so, Lord, help us to walk courageously today, despite opposition, despite how lonely we may feel, despite how op ostracized we may feel, despite the cost, help us to be faithful. Like Noah, in the face of opposition, help us to get on the ark and declare to a watching world that judgment is coming. Help us, Lord. Help us to be faithful while we are here. Faithful in proclaiming the good news, and that you live, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.